in heaven, we believe you are making something beautiful, not just in us individually, but throughout the world, in creation, in recreation, in redemption. And Father, you are capable of making beautiful things because you are beautiful. And Father, the prayer of my heart, and I know the prayer of many hearts here, is that over the course of this week that we will come away with a better and more biblical understanding of who you are and by extension who you aren't that we might better appreciate and better understand your beauty draw us into your presence through the music through the preaching through the fellowship give us a great day today with you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say... All right, good morning, Andrews University. Good morning. good morning, great to be here. My name is Pastor David Asherick, and when I was introduced as being from Kingscliff, Australia, I don't know if you know this or not, I'm actually not Australian. So I hope you're not disappointed by the lack of accent. Um, I can actually do an all right accent, but whenever I try it, the Australians tell me that I sound like a New Zealander. <laughs> and then the New Zealanders tell me I sound like an Australian person, so I don't really do the accent very well. But we've lived in Australia for the last six years. I was in Australia 36 hours ago, so it's 1.45 in the morning or something. Whatever time it is right now, it's that one in the morning or something. So my day yesterday was terrible because I had not one, not two, not three, but four flights. I flew from where I live on the Gold Coast of Australia to Sydney, then from Sydney to Houston. That is a 16-hour flight. And I just want to say, the human body is not supposed to be on an airplane for 16 straight hours. Can I say that? <laughs> um, it got me to thinking, what's the longest flight that's actually available? There's a 20-hour flight. There's a couple of flights around the world that are 20 hours. The longest flight I've ever been on went from Atlanta to Johannesburg. That was 17 hours. So yesterday was close. But then I got to Houston, and I still had to fly to Chicago. And then I got to Chicago, and I still had to fly to South Bend, Indiana. So I'm really upset right now. I should have I come a couple days ago. Um, it's 2019. The last time I was here was in 2013. We had an amazing week of prayer. It was awesome. Great to be back. I want to thank the Andrews University team and all the people that are involved. It's awesome to be here. Super excited. We're going to have a great week together. And I'll tell you something funny. As I was sort of walking around campus yesterday and driving around last evening, I was noticing that it just looks like they're making college students younger and younger. She's like, man, look at all these middle schoolers at college. This is incredible. Look at some of them brought their young brothers and sisters to school. That's so sweet. And it sort of dawned on me that if you look that young to me, I must look like ancient. They're like, oh, look at this old man. This is great. Anyway, so I'm going to do something that I almost never do anymore. It's something that I used to do quite a little bit of, probably in the first three or four years of my um, sort of teaching and preaching and pastoring, but I, I just literally basically never do this, and that's tell some of my own story. But because I was thinking, I bet you a lot of these people don't even know who I am. They'd be like, oh yeah, David Ashrick, my mom really likes him. Oh, yeah, David Asherick, my, that's my granddad's favorite preacher, <laughs> or whatever. So I thought I would spend a little time sort of telling you the story of, of my own experience with Jesus because this will become, I think, a really important segue into what I'm going to be talking about all week, and that is beautiful and believable. We're going to be talking about I, I, I'm going to run ahead and, and, and get tempted to start saying all those things. Let me just tell you a little bit about my story. I'm going to put up a slide here. And uh, this is me and my younger brother. I'm the one in the bottom left-hand corner and uh, in, the, in the tan suit, looking good, I must say. 
Um, that's my beautiful mom in the red, and uh, my granddad and my grandma, uh, Rita and Oak. And uh, you'll notice that something is missing in this picture. What's missing? Yeah, yeah, there's no dad there. And uh, perhaps like some of you, my relationship and my, fa- my brother's relationship to a father figure is a complicated one, right? We're, uh, fatherlessness is, is epidemic in the world today, and I am one of those who um, have a dad somewhere. I've, I've never met him that I can remember. Actually, I've had three dads. That's a long sort of a story that I'm not going to get into right now, but, but at this point in my life, I didn't didn't really have a father figure, and so in many ways I was shaped by my grandparents who became in really like my parents. My mom was single mom, studying nursing, and uh, I did eventually end up with kind of a dad, and my dad, my, the man that I now call my father, really ingratiated himself to me, not so much my mother, when At the age of about 13 years old, he took me to a sporting goods store and my younger brother as well and said, hey, you can get anything you want up to, I think it was like a $50 $50 or something. And so I was like, oh man, this will be incredible. So we went sort of running through looking for what the thing was that we were going to buy up to $50. And the thing that I bought was a skateboard, right? I was just like, oh, I want to get a skateboard anyway. They'll get that figured out. But there's a picture of me skateboarding. And um, at the age, of, from about 13 until 18, I just became super passionate. That would be an understatement. Consumed, obsessed, addicted to skateboarding. And my desire was to become a professional skateboarder. Uh, now, my father, who at the time was the vice president of a university, you can just imagine, he was thrilled. I'd graduated from high school, did quite well in school, actually. And I was like, Dad, I've got some good news and some bad news. And he's like, yeah, what's the good news? I'm like, the good news is I'm going to California. He's like, what's the bad news? I said, the bad news is I'm not going to, you know, one of the universities there. I want to become a professional skateboarder. That went over really well. That's just what parents want to hear. Yeah, my son wants to become a professional skateboarder. And I got a long lecture about how it wasn't going to pan out. And anyway, you know how that works. Uh, So I was really passionate about the skateboarding thing. That's where I sort of poured my energies and my life, my athletic uh, talents into, just had this dream of being a professional skateboarder, moved to California, lived there for uh, about two years with two friends of mine who also went out there with the dream of becoming professional skateboarders. And I don't know how familiar you are, maybe there are some skateboarders here today, but at least when I was sort of in my late teens, skateboard culture was really wrapped up with punk rock culture. And uh, at a young age, at about the age of 14 years old, I was sort of on the outside looking in in my local high school. I wasn't one of the cool kids. And there were a bunch of other kids that weren't the cool kids. And we all sort of got together. And the thing that we had in common was a real passion for punk rock music. And uh, I'm going to put another slide up here. We listened to a lot of bands like Minor Threat. And uh, I purposely put this up here because the guy in the foreground of the photo there, Ian Mackay, uh, was really m- one of my heroes. As a, as a child, and, and this was one of the albums that they released. You'll notice that the album is out of step, and you have all these white sheep that are sort of going in one direction, then you have this black sheep that's off by himself. And, and the fascinating thing about the punk rock band Minor Threat and other bands like them, I'll put up a couple slides here. This is a band called Youth of Today, uh, very similar in message. I'll get to that in a second, to Minor Threat. And then finally, um, the band Shelter. Uh, all of these bands advocated what's called straight edge. Now, does anybody here, raise your hand if you have any idea what I'm talking about when I say straight edge. There's like three of you. Okay, this is great. This is gonna be so fun. Okay. So straight edge actually was based on a minor threat song, and the idea was that we didn't smoke, we didn't drink, We didn't do drugs, and that was called being straight, being straight edge. And so one of the things that we would do as straight edge punk rock kids is we would put large black X's on our hands. And uh, we would go to the various parties and punk rock shows and concerts. And what we were communicating is we don't smoke, we don't drink, we're not into all of that, but sort of concomitant with 
the, the lifestyle of straight edge was a certain style or genre of music, really hardcore, rhythmically driven punk rock music, like Minor Threat, Youth of Today, and other bands. And so from a young age, sort of 16, 17, I was doing the real passionate skateboarding thing. My dream and desire was to become a pro skateboarder, but because the punk rock thing was so wrapped up in that, I also uh, was in a lot of bands. And I think I've got a photo here of me in a band called Via. Um, I would have been probably 21 in this photo. Um, Travis on bass, Mike on drums, and Turi sort of behind my arm there on guitar. And we, we were super passionate. You can sort of extract a little bit of, of that there. In fact, I think the next photo, I've got some more, uh, another band that I was in. This is actually quite fascinating. This is in 1995. This was just a year before my conversion, which I'll get to in a second. This is actually in Detroit, Michigan. My band here was called Single File Line, and we were playing a large festival in Detroit called the Detroit More Than Music Festival. And uh, we were super passionate, super committed, straight edge punk rockers, right? And uh, there's a whole lifestyle that sort of went along with that. And this is sort of hoping to, I'm, I'm hoping it'll sort of paint a picture here of what drove me and how I ended up becoming a follower of Jesus, which is the story I'm really excited about. Okay, next slide. Um, at about this time, I ended up reading a book written by this guy here. I, I'd imagine probably nobody here knows who this is. His name is John Robbins. Now, who's heard of Baskin Robbins? You've heard of Baskin Robbins? Okay. So John Robbins is the son of Irma and Irving Robbins, okay? The founders of Baskin Robbins, right? Like half of Baskin Robbins. And John Robbins was the heir of the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire, right? Like he was slated to take it over. He went to school in Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley. And uh, he became persuaded that uh, eating uh, animals or even animal products was not good for the human body, it was not good for the environment, it wasn't good for the world. And so in a, in a really fantastic move, he actually turned his back on the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire and uh, wrote a book. And this book here, which I'm gonna put up, was the single most formative book in my life as a teenager. Um, I read this book at the age of 17, probably 17, 18, called Diet for a New America. And in the book, John Robbins advocates a, a very strict vegetarian lifestyle. Now, sort of in keeping with the real passion that I had for straight edge, abstaining from alcohol, abstaining from drugs, abstaining from um, cigarettes, and just really trying to, we, we, we practice what we call PPP, positive peer pressure. There's no religious element to any of this, I should say. In fact, there would have been an antagonism toward religion, a, 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 an undisguised hostility toward anything that was religious, particularly Christian. So there's really no, none of that's happening here. This is just sort of a desire to live our best life for ourselves, for our community, and then for the world. And so this vegetarianism thing started to sneak in, and I started reading things like this, right, as an impressionable, passionate, very ideological driven young teenager, John Robbins writes, your life does matter. It always matters whether you reach out in friendship or lash out in anger. It always matters whether you live with compassion and awareness or whether you succumb to distractions and trivia. It always matters how you treat other people, how you treat animals and how you treat yourself. It always matters what you do, it always matters what you say, and it always matters what you eat. And so I, I, this was like my mantra. I was now, I became a, a, an animal rights, um, ethically driven vegetarian. I, in the early stages of my vegetarianism, the fact that it was a healthful diet or that it was good for me, that was almost, it was by, by and by, I didn't really care much about that. I was super passionate about animal welfare, super passionate about environmental sensitivities. And so I'm trying to paint a picture here 
Between the ages of like 18, well, it all began before that. I was into punk rock as a younger teen and into skateboarding as a younger teen, but my sort of worldview was being shaped here, and I really wanted to make a positive impact on the world. I wanted to live my best life, again, without any of the trappings of religion. There was at least an apathy or an ambivalence, and in some instances, an outright hostility toward things that were sort of of a religious flavor. Now, I'm gonna put up here on the screen what, what you might call my sort of 18, 19, 20, 21 year old punk rock values, right? Like if you, would have, if you would have sequestered me and said, hey David, what do you care about? What are you really passionate about? What are the things that get you up in the morning? What are you, what are you into? Um, I would have said, well, I'm, I'm really passionate about a social consciousness and awareness, about learning how to love other people. I was really into community. I would have said I'm committed to equality of all of its various stripes. Uh, I'm nonviolence, really passionate about nonviolence. I was committed, as I mentioned, PPP, positive peer pressure to positivity. I practiced uh, with me and my friends and my bandmates. We all practiced. There was a whole group of us there. A straight edge, now vegetarian lifestyle after reading books like uh, Diet for a New America. Uh, super passionate about animal welfare and environmental responsibility and Back to that out of step thing there on that Minor Threat album cover, the one black sheep that was sort of doing its own thing. I was basically being taught to question authority, to question traditions, and to question norms, right? Like my granddad that was holding me in that photo that I showed you, the first photo that I put up, he was a cattle rancher, right? So you can imagine when I became a vegetarian, this was like a what? You, uh, my dad wanted me to go to university. I decided to become a pro skateboarder. So there's my whole life, as I've given some thought, especially in those formative years, was really shaped by doing something that was different. I, didn't, I don't think I set out to be different. It's just the things that appealed to me, the things that attracted me, were things that were radically countercultural. Like when I became a vegetarian at the age of 17, my mom cried. Okay, this was, this was, for those of you that are like generational vegetarians or maybe you, even just if you're like 20 years old, you think vegetarianism is normal-ish. When I became a vegetarian, okay, you couldn't buy soy milk in a grocery store. I mean, I remember on several occasions like asking the grocery store managers there where I was from in the Midwest, like, hey, do you guys have any soy milk? And they looked at me like I was asking, you know, do you have any Martians on the shelf? Do you have any... So this was like radical. My mom was like, you're going to die. And then I started getting tattoos. And, and my mom, she was like, oh, she was so worried about me. The day I got my first tattoo, she said, you're never going to get a job. <laughs> I became a pastor, so that's actually kind of true. <laughs> I'm only half kidding. So at about this time in my life, uh, a store opened up in my hometown, and the store was called, a vegetarian restaurant, called Unimaginatively Enough Veggies, right? Veggies. And uh, Veggies was run by these super weird people. Um... All of the ladies wore these like long denim dresses and running shoes. All of the dudes had like sort of quasi Amish beards with suspenders and the belt. That's always the double win. That's the double win. When you get the belt and the suspenders. And I think the thing that stuck out to me more than anything, and I've, I've thought a lot about when I first went into this restaurant, because it just opened up like overnight in our town. The thing that really uh, I just couldn't get my head around was they called everybody brother and sister. So I'm like going into this restaurant, and after they'd gotten to know me a couple times, it was a strict, like, vegetarian, we'd say vegan restaurant. I was vegan at this point. They're like, oh, look, it's Brother David. And they just look straight off of, like, Little House on the Prairie, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And I'm going in there with my crew, with my band, and I'm like a purple-haired, tattooed punk rocker, right? And um, 
I probably went to the restaurant for a year. And man, these people were super weird and super cool. I, 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 could, I could tell you stories, but I don't have time to tell you stories. But anyway, they were just the coolest people ever. In fact, the next slide here, this is me uh, in the red wearing a shirt that says straight edge, can't beat the feeling. And uh, I got my arm around the drummer from my band there, notice the suspenders, so I'm in that slow transition. <laughs> I'm in that transition here. I'm like, I, like what you're looking at there is half punk rock, half Amish Adventist. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in the transition there, and, and Dan's there with me, and uh, he, was the, he was the drummer in my band, and, and uh, it was incredible. So I'm in, the, that's, we're actually in the restaurant right there, and uh, I'm in this sort of transition. Next slide is me and the woman who owned the restaurant, the one who opened it up. Her name was Mary, and uh, Mary and Tom opened up this restaurant, and uh, I started to work in this restaurant, and part of Working in this restaurant was praying in the morning, right? Well, I wasn't into the prayer thing. I wasn't in, I've already mentioned, to the religion thing. I wasn't raised like in a religious context. But I'm being like exposed to like radical Christianity here, like full-on, hardcore, super conservative. It, where I come from in Australia now, where I live in Australia now, they shorten like everything. Right, so you don't go to university, you go to uni. Right, they say, oh yeah, he's away at uni. So you don't call somebody a Seventh-day Adventist because that's just way too many syllables. You call them a sevi. <laughs> sevi. Yeah, so you'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, Mark, is he a sevi? Oh yeah, he's a sevi. And here's the thing. If you're like a really conservative sevi, then you're a heavy sevi. I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding. I'm not making this up, it's a true story. So you'd be like, oh yeah, Mark, he's, a, he's an Adventist, right? Oh, heavy sevy, Mike, heavy sevy. <laughs> okay, so, so the people that ran this restaurant were heavy sevies, okay? Like, heavy sevies. <laughs> and so I go in there, is this like purple-haired, punk rock, straight edge, ideologically driven, super passionate young kid who just wants to make a difference in the world and, and just driven, and they're just like praying and they're talking about Jesus, and, and I was like, whoa, really confronted. Well, long story short, I became a follower of Jesus, and that's the story I'm gonna tell you throughout this week, sort of in parts, but I wanna put this slide up here. I say it like this, and I've said this to my, I have two teenage sons, an 18-year-old and a 16-year-old, and they've asked me a lot about punk rock. In fact, they listen to the music that I used to play. They're like, Dad, that music sucks. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? That music's incredible. They're like, you're not even singing. You're just yelling. I'm like, yeah, that, that's, that's what we did. So this is what I tell my sons. The straight-edge punk rock ethic, right, the person that I was at sort of 19, 20, 21 taught me a lot about the what of life, but it, it didn't teach me a lot about the why, right? Like behave ethically and eat responsibly and live in, in, in a socially conscious, environmentally responsible way. It was like check, 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 check. But if I was really pressed by like members of my own family or, or people you know, in, my, in my outer circle, not my inner circle, about why I behaved in certain ways, I was like, ah. Uh, it always boiled down to sort of like preference, and I hated that. Oh, it just drove me crazy. I, I really longed for like what, what we would say a transcendent grounding. I wanted something that had m more permanence to it. I, I, I was really passionate about finding something secure and certain and even absolute. And uh, this was sort of beginning to provide that for me. Next slide. Um, they gave me the book, The Great Controversy, which I read in 1995. Uh, the book, The Great Controversy, then led me to a book called The Bible, uh, which we're gonna be spending uh, all of our time on uh, this week. It's gonna be incredible, I can't wait. And that was really transformative. That was the thing that changed everything. Next slide. As I started to read these things, on June 6th, 1996, 
I was baptized and became a follower of Jesus, June 6, 1996. So, next slide. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So, if you do the math on that, that's like 23 years ago. Okay, so that's half of my life. I'm 46 years old here today. Half of my life, I'm actually 47. What am I saying? 47 now. Just turned last month. So I've lived half of my life as a follower of Jesus, a committed, passionate, radical follower of Jesus, and I live the other half of my life as a committed, passionate, radical person, but not a follower of Jesus, okay? And I want to talk to you about why I became a committed follower of Jesus. How, how, did, how did that transition happen? Because I'll be honest with you, when Mary and Tom and the others in the Veggie's restaurant started sharing with me, like, the story about Jesus, I was like, yeah, that's a cool story. That's great. I like that. I wish that were true. Right? I found the story, you might say, aesthetically pleasing. Right? It appealed to my moral sensibilities. It appealed even to my aesthetic sensibilities. But I was nowhere near the threshold of believer because I just there was just too many obstacles for me as a non religious, purple-haired punk rocker. There were just too many obstacles for believability. So I want to show you this last two slides here, and then I'll let you go for the day. So anyway, this is a slide I've already put up, but I'll just review it with you here. Here's my punk rock values, if you would have found me uh, at the age of sort of 20, 21, something like that. Social consciousness, love for others, equality, nonviolence, positivity, straight-edge vegetarian lifestyle, animal welfare, environmental responsibility, question authority, tradition norms. Now watch this. Watch how this slide tr transitions when I share with you what are my present biblical values. You ready? Did you see that? Okay, go back one if you don't mind. And then again, forward. Do you see what's happening there? Okay, let's just go back over them. My present values, if you, if you were to sequester me now, pull me aside now and say, David, what's the stuff you're really passionate about? I'd be like, well, social consciousness, love for others, equality, nonviolence, positivity, a straight-edge vegetarian lifestyle, animal welfare, environmental responsibility, question authority, traditions and norms. I'm the same guy. Which is why I hate it when people say the ex-punk rocker or the former punk rocker. I'm like, man, I'm as punk rock as I've ever been. <laughs> Last slide. Last slide. This week we're going to be talking about beauty and believability. In looking at those two sort of moral codes or ethical codes, sort of the pre-Christian moral code and the post-Christian moral code, a cursory view of that might lead you to think, well, nothing changed. Same values, same ethical structure. The truth is, everything changed, but this is key. Not so much the what. The, the what has stayed remarkably similar, right? The, the things that I was into then, I'm into now. But the why has totally changed. The story that I thought was really beautiful and really aesthetically pleasing, I have come to find to be not only beautiful from an aesthetic sense or from an appealing sense, I have found it to be absolutely believable. And what we're going to be talking about in the mornings as well in the evenings is what are the criterion and the, the thresholds for beauty and for believability? And I hope that you will be, I'll be really honest, I'll just put my cards on the table here. I'm hoping that there are some really passionate, really ideologically driven, maybe not purple-haired, but teenagers in here, and even late, early 20s, late teens, who will make the same transition that I made from having an appreciation of something sort of religious to becoming a follower of Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's a little bit about who I am, and we're going to have an absolutely great week together. So glad to be here. God bless you all.